The author of An Elegant Young Man, Giramondo Publishing House, a book awarded the New South Wales Premier's Literary Award for New Writing. Luke Harma is an academic at Western Sydney University's Writing and Society Research Centre. In 2014, the Sydney Morning Herald named him the best young novelist. One of his stories, Liverpool Boys, is used in the SBS podcast series entitled Two Stories, which showcases what SBS calls Australia's best emerging and early career writers. He has published in HIT, West Side, and the Cultural Studies Review. But especially, Luke is a judge for New Writers Group competition, Zin West, starting in 2015. Luke, thank you very much for presenting our anthology. Hello everybody and uh, thank you very much uh, to Mahela and to Sue and Carol for inviting me to do this again. It's a great honour uh, to be involved with a project that uh, is in some ways extremely unlikely. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's amazing that uh, a, a project like this has not only uh, come about in the first place but has managed to go from strength to strength over a period of five years. Uh, when it could very easily have not have happened in the first place. Um, but uh, obviously it has. And uh, I'm back again feeling extremely unqualified to talk about a book, uh, half of which I can't understand at all. Um, so I'll get on with it and I'll stick to the, uh, the English. So uh, I was afraid that I would run out of time to do on the Wallaby track justice. Uh, so I set aside a Saturday two weeks ago to do nothing but read the collection and think about its contents. I've been very excited to read it because, uh, well, since receiving in the mail, that is, because uh, Luminita Sibonescu's cover art, which you've seen, uh, resonated with me in a, in a very strange sort of way. Um, and I'll just quickly explain a little bit about that. It's a story, if you don't mind, uh, but I'll try to get through it as quickly as I can. Uh, when I was a kid, we were the first on our street to own a computer. It was a long time ago. And each afternoon after school, my brother and my mother and I would play a game on this computer called Hero's Quest, in which you would move this sandy-haired man around through the woods and towns of some unspecified European country on a journey to become a hero by slaying goblins, ogres, witches and dragons, rescuing maidens and undoing curses, and helping peasants find their lost treasures in the darkness of the forest. Uh, I, I can't exactly explain it, but uh, limited as cover illustration of the well in the wood. Uh, it took me back to those early encounters of uh, the idea of a hero's journey, because the image looks so much like a scene from that fictional European place, uh, that it seems strange to me that uh, it isn't part of the same things. It, to me, it looks like a part of the game, and uh, uh, that had a really strange effect on me. But putting that aside for a moment, when I woke up on the Saturday that I put aside to read the book two weeks ago, the first thing I did is I reached over for the radio I keep by the bed, because I, I, I'm, I'm not a good morning person. It takes me a long time to get out of the covers, so I usually listen to the radio until I can't stand it anymore, and then I get up. <laughs> And, and that morning just so happened to be on some ABC station, uh, an interview. It was a journalist conversing with a very famous scientist who happened by chance to be discussing his dis uh, obsession with wells. Uh, and the, the very first thing I heard the famous scientist say was there had once been an ancient Greek, whose name I've subsequently forgotten, who deduced that the earth was round by observing the shadows or the angles of shadows within wells. So according to this famous scientist, this ancient Greek guy, whose name I can't recall, observed that at certain times of day, the sun would shine directly upon the water at the bottom of the well in the center of town. And at all other times, the shadows of various angles completely obscured the water. And so soon enough, this ancient Greek, whose name I've forgotten, realized that if two men stood at two separate wells on opposite sides of the town, and observed and recorded in unison the angles of the shadows cast in their depths, they would be able by this means to deduce the shape of the earth itself. So, 
Having thus provided this tale, the scientists began to talk about ships moving towards the horizon, and I subsequently lost interest and was sufficiently awakened uh, to get on with the business of reading on the Wallaby track and begin thinking about its contents. And I never would have begun my address to you this afternoon by relating such a banal and random occurrence as a discussion on the radio, uh, were it not for the epigraph on the, the opening of On the Wallaby Track, which reads, I said to myself, what is this that I am doing? It certainly is not science, so what is it? Then a voice said to me, this is art. And this made the strongest sort of impression upon me because it was not in any sense my impression that what I was writing was art. So this epigraph is taken from Black Book 2, from Carl Jung's The Red Book, which is an enigmatic collection of work written during the Great War, but unpublished in 2009. I remember the 21st century publication of Jung's The Red Book very well, uh, because in 2009 I was very briefly married. And in a desperate attempt to impress my mother-in-law, I went searching for the most expensive and beautiful book I could find, and in a narrow bookstore on a new town street, I found a shelf full of the red books. Uh, they cost $200 each at the time. And they were stacked and wrapped in plastic beneath a display copy that was open with all its elegant hand-drawn script and its rich mystic imagery. Uh, the red book is a work of mytho-poetic imagination, according to its author. And Jung called its production the most important period of his life. Other people, historians, uh, called it a, a time of pure psychosis. <laughs> and in writing this enigmatic analysis on myth, architecture and literature, Jung would will himself into these visions and confront the dream world of his own imagination with this kind of rabid tenacity. And he wouldn't let the characters that he envisioned retreat from his mind until, they, until he wrested from them all possible meaning that he could get. And then he sort of dismiss them. Uh, I don't really understand what how that would happen, how that process actually took place. But nevertheless, it was in this period that uh, he developed the idea of the introvert and the extrovert, his concept of synchronicity, and most centrally, his idea of individuation, uh, which is, in other words, the essential journey of transformation through which one becomes what one is. Okay, so uh, all of this is to say that I came to Wallaby Track uh, in a virulently Jungian frame of mind, uh, full of the speculations of a long dead but ever-present analyst, and I read therefore in the first work, uh, the, a poem by Mahela, uh, which says, the water telling the truth to the newborn house in the summertime. And I began to see from that beginning that this was a book about the telling of truths that Jung saw as an essential journey through seasons of light and darkness. And Anna Maria Belgian's Between Ashes and Diamonds uh, elaborated on this theme for me because the moral at the heart of it is one of inheritance and regeneration. And the narrator summarizes the dilemma of meaning in these terms. You don't want to go too far. You don't want to burden your offspring with things redundant. But on the other hand, you must pass on what is worth passing on, and no one can tell you exactly what that is. And in the balance in this story are immense ideas. It's, say for instance, on the one hand, the brutalism of the Iron Curtain, and on the other, the kaleidoscopic emptiness of a consumerist blasphemy. And it takes this measure of life, and the narrator considers the possibility of a luminous death, the idea of a luminous death. Uh, and that brings some consolation. It's a kind of transformative thought for the narrator. But even then, there's a paradoxical cloud that begins to fog up the narrator's mind. It's the fog of meaning. And it swallows the narrator at the end of the story. And the next story is Shannon Woodcock's Triptych, where the narrator is possessed by a kind of darkness of spirit in Jungian terms, if you like. Uh, Jung in Ion argued that the origin of the human e the origin of human evil was represented by a Mistophelian spirit, and that is a horror at being itself, which suggests that it would be better if everything that was didn't exist in the first place. 
so not only that existence is punishment, but it's irredeemable. There's no redemptive dimension to it whatsoever. And the narrator in Triptych is looking at a child in a wedding, in a wedding gown who is licking sugar bowls on tables. And in seeing this act, the narrator decides that it's time to destroy everything and begin again from the grassroots. The next story is Iwana Petrescu's, I'm sorry for my, my pronunciation, I'm terrible with names, not just Romanian names, all names, I, I can't pronounce names, but her piece, Whale Watching, offers almost a salve to this kind of demoralized spirit, uh, or a desire for, a salve for the desire for divine vengeance, I think. And it reverts the world and the perspective of the world and places the, re the reader under the water, beneath the water, looking up. Uh, it's a transcendental experience of uh, amorphous potential that just explodes into pure colour. There's an Australian author, Gerald Benane, who does this same sort of thing. He gets so excited and so overwhelmed by things that he just breaks into pure colour and just starts naming one colour after another. Uh, and I think there's a dimension of that in Iwana's way of watching. So, Sue, is Sue here today? S Sue Shaman? Okay. Well, um, I'm going to keep going on and on, uh, talking about every work. So, Sh Sue Shaman's work, uh, I've read it before. It's called The Black, Red and White Door, and it's a study of the architecture of meaning, where doors are portals between memories and the spaces which shape existence itself. And it's a reminder that memory is a chain of rippling associations which we construct, through which we construct ourselves and the world around us. A J.N. de Stakes Makara is a eulogy of a different kind. It's a poetic accounting for the balance between the drudgery of bearing, life, bearing life's burdens, where the narrator is walking against the wind and there's always mud underfoot. And the narrator is not used to the weight of an old mother, the narrator's mother, in a coffin, nor the murmuring of rosary beads the night before and a long drive in a black car. So these are the burdens which we've got to measure against the slimmest kind of consolation, where the consolation for carrying your mother in a coffin is a bit of good weather uh, on the day of her funeral. So it's kind of a grim picture, but... I was, as I said, coming at it with this Jungian idea and then all of a sudden I got to Peter Cartwright's poem, Leaving Ermo, uh, and that made me drop all the psychoanalytic pretenses. I just, maybe there's something psychoanalytic about it, but I, I just couldn't see it. it. just, I got caught up in this kind of demotic uh, evocation of suburban life. And it's a sort of subterranean landscape of mouldy nights and sweaty afternoons. And it just swept me away completely. And the next, his next poem is Concreting Day, which is really tender, bittersweet. Um, but then uh, Laura Dunatudor Tomescu's poem comes along, and it completely broke that spell. I was back in the, the Jungian mind. It's, it's called It's Spring Back Home. And the reason it brought me back to that is because it takes the reader to the question of possessing spirits. It's all about being possessed. Uh, there are actual spirits in the text. They're, they're lurking under the branches and they're smoking in the frozen air. And then the poet has to turn in response to these kind of spirits uh, to the exorcism of a telephone, uh, but there are no answers to the questions that come howling down the line. And then it ends. Uh, and it's quite a devastating effect. And then Jason Gray, I've read his work before, uh, and his story flashes is, is quite the opposite because it takes you straight back to the earthly world uh, waiting or on a train. And I notice that seems to be one of the, the structuring elements of this book is that you have these really intense kind of uh, abstract pieces and then you're back on a train station somewhere. But in this one, the narrator is absolutely consumed by his own guilt. Uh, and he's paralyzed by the original sin of self-consciousness and crushed by the burden of the past dead weight uh, and he's on a train ride home to nowhere and he's completely undone by young women flashing themselves at him. Just quite a grim uh, prospect, I think, 
to be disarmed by that. Uh, Cosman Perders, the wind has torn down old wells for years, old walls for years. It self-describes as the fourth lullaby for his generation, and it's a work that really does seem to yearn for a new way of making meaning in a time of chaos. It begins sort of like the Divine Comedy. I think it's a direct reference on a journey midway through our hero's life. And it's looking for a kind of new apocalyptic uh, way of making sense of the dehumanized time. And there's this abomination that sort of slumps uh, in the dusty bedrooms and a dead, dreadful sun turns to ash at the end. And then we've got, you know, total contrast with Francis Anne's piece, uh, Hourglass, because it's a kind of the death of fairy tale, loss of innocence story about uh, seething with resentment for being let down by a lover uh, and a kind of resentment for the fantasies with which we construct our world. And it's a story about uh, measuring time or the prospect of measuring time being completely dismantled, which reminded me of Borden's Funeral Blues, where the clocks and the sun are dismantled. Uh, Alex Pes Pleskin presents us with a, another large theme story. It's the story of everything. And it's an origin tale that's rooted in completely unreliable narration. It's a sense of a kind of deconstruction of the archetypical story. And it's a, almost a parody of the rules of narrative. It's this uh, existential angst just thrown at the nature of language itself. But it's, it's not turgid. It's got a great sense of humour. It's, uh, it's got a really strong sense of irony, almost like Dostoevskyan sense of irony. Uh, and it, at the story's end, it summons up this ideal woman uh, who can see the past and the future all together, but for the moment is just sleeping. Uh, and in her sleep, she dreams all our collective dreams. She's the mother of the collective unconscious. And then again, we've got Shirley Lee who brings us back to the trains. Uh, and in this time, it's about an awkward conversation about fake eyelashes and buns of steel in a story called Failed Gangers. I remember this story. It won Zine West in 2014, and it's an examination of prejudice, the trappings of perception, and that what we seek is what we find. It's richer than I even remember it, but I think it still would have won the competition even just for its name because the title <laughs> Failed Gangers, it kind of remain, reminds us that you can... In failing to be something debased is not necessarily a triumph. That there's actually something paradoxically comforting about being fixed into place, no matter how cruelly or pitifully you're pinned. So then you go from waiting in the train back to Jung and his journeying heroes uh, in Victoria Malescu's poems. The first one is travelling, and it seems, you know, to me, uh, because I was just in that frame of mind, it's almost a distillation of the idea of individuation, because it's the idea that we have to transform as we move through the world, and the world, in turn, is transformed by us. Uh, and then it's developed even further in the, the next poems, which are In the Rain and In the Central Square. These two poems, when you check them out yourself, I think you'll see, I think it's correct to say that they're almost an investigation of the arbitrary nature of the idea that we are outside of the world or the world is outside of us and the idea of human language being the only index for meaning. Uh, because after all, pigeons come down and they peck on, our, peck on our heads and they peck at our visions and then they write them on the blue paper of the sky, and according to the poem. Uh, and then we've got Robin Young, uh, his poem, No Room. Essentially, from my reading, it turns the Pacific solution into an antichrist. And you get these three ships that are the wise men, and our nation is like an eyeless... Well, it's sort of... It's an entity that has plucked the guiding star out of its own socket, and then starts obscuring the word of God with names and silences, the choir of heaven. And it's kind of like an uprooting of the idea of the journey, uh, because the journey requires an A to B. But in this poem, the B is gone. The journey can't go anywhere. Uh, and the poet says at the end, all the souls on earth are needed. It reminds you, all the souls on earth are needed. Uh, because without them, there's no voice and there's no rejoicing in heaven. In the next story, Norm Fairbairn, kind of like T.S. Eliot in The Wasteland, he's travelling over the terrain of Europe 
still stitched to war, but also now dealing with the burden of the immeasurable cost of peace. And like Elliot, Fairbairn buries the dead in language, and then he waits for some promised dawn, watching the fuelless trucks expire on the unlit uplands of a doubtful sunrise. The next poem is, actually it's a short piece, a short piece of prose by Sam Payne. I know Sam, he's an artist, I didn't, he's a visual artist, I didn't know he wrote, but anyway. Uh, in this one it's really strange, he mobilises Michelangelo's David. He turns the sculptor's triumph uh, into a little animate sort of uh, homunculus, if you like. And because it's the age of infinite reproduction, there's millions of them. So it's not just David's Michelangelo that's suddenly alive and running towards the sea. It's millions of little representations or reproductions of David running towards the ocean, all kind of like lemmings trying to commit suicide by just disappearing into the ocean, uh, all across the globe. Except in... And everybody's aware of this. Everybody's panicking because David's just killing themselves, except for the narrator, who doesn't notice, because the narrator is in Sydney, and his own little miniature David souvenir magnet can't free itself from the fridge door. <laughs> I think it's really weird, because this is, piece is kind of like the exemplar of something that the, the Western Sydney poet Jennifer Maiden said, and that's that nowhere else on earth can the essential and eternal reversing dialectic between icon and iconoclast be observed and experienced as in the fringes of city? I think it's true. Okay, so you've got this swifty and fantasy uh, homunculus uh, David to the everyday horrors of modern dating in Oliver Jacques' story, uh, where he brings us back to this brutal theme of pride and prejudice in his short piece, Where Do You Come From? Now, Hero here is ashamed of his status in the Sydney game of suburbs because he's been beaten back from the acceptable affluence of the inner west to the crushing debasement of the outer suburbs. And he sits in solitude at a table waiting for his date, surrounded by carefree, cavorting millennials. But uh, it's a torturous super-ego that's the villain of the story because when his date arrives, she doesn't have any of the, the judgment that he's burdening himself with, torturing himself with. Then you've got Rebecca Slater's piece, which is called Winnie Blues, The Winnie Blues. And it's a very sharp, short slab of prose where the cigarettes become the symbol of the serpent in the garden of one man's long-suffering life. He's kind of pathetic, he's pitiful. Uh, but then it ends in this really Jungian kind of way where the narrator decides that uh, perhaps it's useful to incorporate the shadowy aspect of his own dilemma into his being, acknowledging at long last that everybody's got a little bit of poison in it. Okay, so, uh, I'm no psychoanalyst, by the way. This is all just made up completely in my own mind. I don't know whether these interpretations are uh, adequate or uh, legitimate whatsoever, but I carried them right to the end, because finally you get to the last piece, uh, which is by Luminator Subinescu herself, right? Is this correct? The, the Wells? Where did the pieces of the Wells come from? That's you again. Oh my God, okay. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry for nearly giving Luminita even more credit uh, when it's actually yours. Okay, but nevertheless, it's next to this picture called Ancient Wells, and it really got me thinking about, obviously, the meaning of, of Wells and what they're doing here, and, it's, and why they're emphasised throughout this collection. And I think it's, to me at least, it became obvious that there were sort of these simple sites of, of human need, but they were also in this piece kind of signposts of these countless journeys made across the shared plane of human consciousness. And I like to imagine that these linguistic worlds are sort of flashes of court memory, sort of reserves of experience where down in the shadowy depths, they're waiting sort of serenely for someone, a traveler, to come along and draw upon their riches and then bring in what we are most into the light of a shared and sacred human spirit. Uh, while we dream together in a well-rounded earth. Um, so I've spoken for a long time, and I appreciate your patience, uh, but that's all I have to say, and I, again, thank you very much for asking.